A few years ago, I was in a pastor's meeting, and uh, one of the more prosperous pastors, you know, uh, one of the more proud pastors was telling about how many new staff members he had, and he came to me and he said, well, how many ministers do you have over there at Fountain of Life? And I knew that he was really meaning how many people do you have on staff there at Fountain of Life. And, but he used the word ministers. And so uh, I just said, well, you know, it just depends. I guess somewhere between 80 and 120 ministers. His jaw dropped. He says, you have that many people on staff? I said, no, we have a very small staff, but everybody in our church is a minister. Come on. How many know you're a minister? You are a minister. All right. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 11. It's in your uh, notes in your bulletin on the screen. Today, this is what the Word says. It says, and he himself. Who's that talking about? King Jesus, right? Jesus gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. I like that last phrase, for the equipping of the saints. Now, when people talk about saints, many times they think of, you know, the Catholic Church and different saints. That's not what this is talking about, all right? You are a saint if you know Jesus, all right? So you can tell your neighbor, if, how many of you know Jesus? If you G- know Jesus and he's in you and you're in him, then you're a saint, amen? So you didn't know that? But listen, in other words, Every saint is supposed to do the work of the ministry. Every one of us is to be involved. A young reporter once asked a college football coach how the game of football had contributed to the health and fitness of America. And he replied, it hasn't contributed at all. Well, the reporter was mystified. He's like, what do you mean? And the coach replied, well... Football is where 22 men on the field that desperately need rest, and and you have 67,000 people in the stands that desperately need exercise. All right? And so I hate to say it, but, but that might be a very good description of some churches in the world today. Some people go to church the way you or I might go to a the Houston Texans game or the or the Rockets game and we kind of we cheer from the stands but we never put on a helmet or pick up a football or put up a basketball and what the bible is teaching here in the book of Ephesians is that when you gather with the church here on Sundays you are putting on a uniform and you are jogging out on through the field to declare I am in the game and the game by the way is not just taking place on Sunday morning it takes place on All through the week. Every single Christian is to be involved in ministry. Now, sometimes people refer to the pastor as minister. That's okay. Uh, So sometimes they say, so when did you go into the ministry? And listen, listen, here's the thing. The moment you were born again, you went into the ministry. You may not have even known it. The moment you were saved, you became a minister. And so every Christian is in the ministry, whether, they're, whether they uh, you know, are in full-time ministry or whether they, you know, whether they work outside of the church, wherever they're, you're in the ministry. You know why? Because church is not a spectator sport. It's not a spectator sport. If your involvement in church has been that you kind of show up And just kind of passively watch what goes on, but never get involved in serving, then you are involved in something that is completely foreign to the New Testament. Because New Testament believers are servants. Am I right? Uh, And so it's time for this church of Jesus Christ to stop going to church, and it's time for this church to start being the church. Come on. The church is not a bus in which the pastor does all the driving and the members sleep in the seats. Come on. The church is not a David and Goliath thing, right? Where the pastor goes out to fight, you know, the giants while God's people set up on the hill and hope that Goliath goes down. Come on. Do I have any giant slayers in the house today? Come on. Do I got any people of God that know how to fight for the kingdom of God? Come on. Every Christian is to be fully involved in the ministry of his or her local church. One of the most crippling things that ever happened to the church 
is that over, over the centuries is that there became this kind of special class of people that they call clergy. Clergy. And another, and they're supposed to be the clergy do all the ministry and the laity do all the watching of the ministry. That is completely unbiblical. Come on. All of us are ministry, ministers. And so it's true that God does call some people into the office of prophet or evangelist, apostle, pastor, teacher. And that's all very, very biblical. But every single one of us is to be involved in ministry. But you know, a lot of people say to themselves, you know, I'm just not qualified. I don't know much about the Bible. Listen, don't let the devil lie to you like that. Hey, come on, you can help your neighbor rake the lawn. You can, you can bring a pie over to somebody who's feeling down and encourage them. Come on. We can work together for the King of Kings. Amen. And it's, it's, not, it's not you. It's not your righteousness that qualifies you anyway. Amen. Some people say, I just don't feel good enough. I'm not good enough to serve. That's absolutely not true. If you belong to Jesus, you have His righteousness. Come on. You are the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and, and you can be a Effective in ministry and in serving. God equips the willing and available, not those who are qualified. Amen. Why did he choose fishermen? <laughs> tax collectors you regular guys to be his disciples in fact paul says not many wise not many noble not many of the educated were called you want to know why because the spirit of god is sufficient to be able to empower us to serve him how many of you believe in the empowering of the holy spirit the third person of the trinity the baptism of the holy spirit I, don't get me wrong i thank god for natural talents, right? Everybody's got some natural talents that they can use to serve the Lord, and that's great, but that's not sufficient enough. All the natural talents in the world won't do the job. We need to depend upon the Holy Spirit to empower us. That is what makes us effective. We need the Spirit. Let me read this verse for you. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse number 6 says this, who also made us Wait, is us in your Bible? That means it's you. All of us. This isn't about me. This is about us. Who made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Ooh, I want everybody just to straighten up and poke your stand tall. You are sufficient as a minister of the new covenant. Amen. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit, right? For the letter kills, but the Spirit of God gives life. Come on. We're all ministers of the new covenant. And the life that we have, the ability to minister, doesn't come from ourselves. It doesn't come even from the letter from the law. No, sir. It, the life comes because of the Spirit of the living God empowering us, anointing us, touching us, giving us the ability. Come on. Somebody give Jesus a big hand of praise today. Amen. So we're all ministers and we're all supposed to be ministering, right? So the question becomes, who are we supposed to minister to? Well, I just have a few uh, points here to talk to you about. And I'm going to give them to you kind of in the order of their importance. Now, you can't leave. I've got three groups that I'm going to talk about. You can't leave any of them out. But how many of you know that God in everything gets the preeminence? Amen? So the first thing we ought to be ministering to is ministering to the Lord. And when we hear the term ministry, we almost inevitably, we think in terms of ministering to the needs of people, right? And, 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 and this is an, an area that is frequently not taught in churches, uh, even thought about, but it's ministry to the Lord. We, you know, we think uh, because the needs of people are so glaringly obvious that when we think of serving or ministry, we're serving and ministering to people. But uh, and, we, and what we understand is that Jehovah God, right, the creator, the sustainer of all things, you know, he is sufficient in and of himself. Uh, we might think he doesn't need anyone to minister to him. But if you examine the word, I think you'll discover that the word of God tells us something different. God allows us to minister to him. It is a privilege to minister to him. And I think it's something that is necessary. If we're going to be effective in ministry, 
ministering to the world around us and to the body of Christ, we've got to learn how to minister to the Lord because it's our connection for, to Him that our power comes. Come on. It's as we connect with Him, we are like branches in the vine. Amen. Amen. And so we've got to understand. In fact, what's interesting is that when God gave the law at Mount Sinai, right, he established his people as a nation and organized them as a worshiping army. What he did was fascinating because he took one of the 12 tribes, one of the divisions of Israel, and he set them as a part for a reason. And that reason was to minister to the Lord. One out of 12 was ministering to the Lord. And what's interesting about the Old Testament is that it often sheds light on the New Testament. If you study the Old Testament and the New Testament together, wow, you're just going to get revelation after revelation. And so I want to go through a few things today and show you the power of ministry to the Lord. All right? Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 8. How many of you are ready for the Word? Amen. You're hungry. Amen. This is what the Word says. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord to stand before the Lord to do what to minister to him to the Lord and to bless his name to this day that must have been one of the greatest privileges in all of Israel to be of the tribe of Israel it meant that you know you actually didn't get an inheritance in the land your inheritance was the Lord himself your portion was the Lord himself uh, what a great joy they must have had to wait upon God to be there for Jehovah to, to, to be in the presence of El Shaddai amen to express the greatness of God in his presence and to love him as he desired. First Chronicles 23 verse 13 gives us a little more uh, information. It says the sons of Amram, Aaron and Moses. And Aaron was set apart, he and his sons forever, that he should sanctify the most holy things, to burn incense before the Lord. And look what the next phrase says. To minister to him. To minister to him and to give the blessing of his name forever. That word minister here in the Hebrew is the word sharath, which means to attend to, to minister to, to serve, to wait on. You say, well, what did they do? Well, back in those days, there was a lot for the priests and the Levites to do in regard to tabernacle and temple ministry. There was a whole sacrificial system that they had to attend to. There were certain articles within the temple itself that had to be taken care of in certain prescribed ways and, 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 and of course you and I know that uh, we don't have to bring a lamb or a turtle dove or a ram aren't you glad we don't have to bring a sacrifice to the Lord like that you want to know why it's because Jesus Christ was the perfect Passover lamb amen he died amen and his blood is sufficient come on his blood is sufficient to wash us and cleanse us amen so we don't have to do that part of Old Testament ministry anymore I'm grateful Grateful for that. Otherwise, we'd probably be having a little bit of a different odor in here today. Am I right? Come on. All right. You say, well, what did they do? What, 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 how do we minister to the Lord today? You know, since we don't do all of that, what do we do today? Let's go a little deeper, all right? When David brought back the ark into Jerusalem, he appointed and financed 4,000 Levites for the express purpose of praising the Lord with the musical instruments that he had provided. Wow. These singers and musicians, they, 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 they were not serving to provide entertainment to David or to the palace or even to the people, but rather to offer 24-7 day and night worship before the ark of his presence and to minister to before the Lord. Can you imagine that? All these men that would come with their with their worship, with their music, and that there was an audience of one. And, and how many of you realize that the Ark of the Covenant, you know, that was a, must have been a beautiful thing, right? It was covered in gold. It had beautiful cherubim on either side. It was, it was a beautiful thing. But it was not the Ark of the Covenant that they were singing for. Come on. It was the presence that came down on the mercy seat. God himself was there. The presence of the Lord was there. And so and so, all of these musicians 24-7 would come and praise and bring worship to the Lord. 